everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, good time of the day to everybody and good morning from Washington, D.C. Um, we're here to um, talk about smart government solutions. Um, this is the second webinar in the series uh, through E-Institute at the World Bank. Um, and we will be talking about new innovative ways to engage citizens um, and give you examples from Albania and Pakistan. My name is Jana Kunitseva. I'm a senior public sector specialist here at the World Bank. Um, and I am joined by my colleague and dear friend, Zubair Bati, uh, who is in Lahore, Pakistan at this very moment. Zubair is a senior public sector management specialist at the World Bank, but uh, he has uh, decades of experience in the government and international organizations, private sector, even media, um, working on um, public sector performance and actually improving the way that governments engage with citizens. In fact, Zubair had started uh, very similar initiatives uh, that we will be talking about uh, during this webinar in his civil service career in Pakistan. So you're, you're you definitely have the right person to tell you about uh, this work. Zubair, over to you. Uh, a little bit more in detail, Jana Kunisova, my co-presenter here. Uh, Jana is a senior public sector specialist with uh, the ECA uh, practice here at the World Bank. And she has worked uh, in uh, Czech Republic, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, many other countries uh, in the ECA region. And we work closely together uh, on the Albania citizen centric uh, service delivery project, which uses this kind of engagement as a central platform for measuring quality and listening to the beneficiaries. Uh, Jana will be moving. Uh, in the next uh, few months to Malaysia, where she will be leading the knowledge hub work of the East Asia uh, practice. Over to you, Yana. Thank you, Zubair. Um, so for our audience, um, I'd like to start our webinar uh, with a short four minute video about the Albania experience with engaging citizens to improve service delivery. So please tune in, listen in, enjoy the video, and we'll pick it up from there.
video. Um, so a few words about why these types of initiatives are important. I risk preaching to the choir, so to speak, since if you have tuned into this webinar, you probably believe this is this is crucial for development work. But perhaps I'll I'll just give you um, three reasons um, that that we believe this is important. So first, um, the existing body of knowledge, the existing studies, uh, do confirm that accountability and trust are key to actually delivering for the state to deliver quality services. Um, you might be familiar with a new study, uh, World Bank study, called uh, Trust, Voice, and Incentives, Learning from Local Success Stories and Service Delivery. Um, and that's actually focusing on a different region than what we're talking about today. So this is uh, in Middle East and North Africa. And our colleagues in this study study success stories, really very, very isolated, so to speak, success stories in delivering health and education in states, within states that are not so good at it. So what makes success in those stories? And they find is that accountability actually motivates public officials to do a better job. And trust, higher trust of citizens, um, actually reduces informality. So it is then when, citizen trust, uh, when citizens trust the government, that they actually turn to the government for the services. They don't um, um, look for alternative informal ways or don't look to pay bribes to obtain services. Um, so indeed, um, engaging with citizens to increase accountability and increase trust is key to, to delivering higher quality services. That's what explains those success stories in Middle East and North Africa, and we believe it travels outside Middle East and North Africa, since we're talking about Europe and um, uh, Southeast Asia today. Um, so that's one reason. Um, another reason I'll give you from my own experience uh, with development work um, for the last decade, and I found that even working with the most authoritarian, hierarchical governments um, that um, are not democracies, um, we got a lot of traction um, asking decision makers uh, who actually cared about providing services to the population, asking them to ask for feedback, ask citizens. So even the most authoritarian governments who want to provide services uh, care about whether the citizen actually gets the service and what the, the citizen thinks about getting the service. There is a lot of talk in these countries about vertical accountability, internal accountability, um, but there is a link to the accountability to citizens. So that's that's another reason to do this. You can do this pretty much everywhere, not just in an open democratic system. Um, and the third reason, well, it's not even a reason, it's just to, to draw on the experience of our own institution, um, the World Bank, um, with our own rules and, and checklists has caught on to this and now requires, it's a corporate requirement, for our um, new loans to have some kind of um, aspect of citizen engagement. So we work with governments uh, who borrow from us um, to implement um, particular reforms to engage their citizens as much as they can. Oftentimes it is essentially third party monitoring of procurement or quality of say the road that, that is built with, with the World Bank money. But many times um, and increasingly so, it involves innovative um, uh, avenues to, to address uh, this requirement uh, just such as one that we're discussing today um, that we had built in into a new loan in, in Albania. So with this introduction as to why this is important, over to Zubair, who will talk you through nuts and bolts of this particular tool. Thank you, Yana. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, we, if you can see on the screen, 
you will see a very typical citizen engagement technique used in many many countries uh you see an email address or a cell number or a hotline number which asks for complaints to be sent to a central agency in this particular case this photograph is from uh, an airport in uh, in pakistan uh, and the ict and the modern aspect of this is uh, is that it they are using a cell number instead of the standard uh, uh mail mail address or something uh, uh more uh, uh, older now this is something which is being used in the public sector in many 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 countries but this we believe is insufficient it's useful but is insufficient to meet and to reach the large number of citizens that get services across the spectrum of government public services in many many different contexts and let's look at how the private sector does it this is second look at this uh, uh sms that you get when you visit uh, a a franchise of a telecom company and they actually proactively ask you well you visited our center if you look at the translation please reply with yes if you are satisfied and with no if you are not and reply is free of cost the key difference between the way government traditionally has done it and you saw an example and how the private sector does it and you must have received many emails over time from hotels where you have stayed and they keep on sending you emails and asking for feedback is that the government is kind of sitting there and waiting for complaints to come to it on the other hand the private sector quite regularly actually proactively reaches you to seek feedback in a sense it's not so focused on complaints but broadly about the range of quality service delivery issues and even probably positive feedback that fundamental change of the citizen not reaching and coming to the state but the state trying to reach the citizen is something that we are trying to implement through this mechanism and that is the core point which is fundamentally different from what we are trying to do in albania and pakistan compared with the standard citizen engagement techniques it is if you see the slide here you know the classic methods would call the creative kind of complaint based mechanisms wait for complaints to be lodged they are focused only on negative things they may want to just improve in individual cases redress individual complaints and more importantly they can often have very high noise depending upon different country contexts the complaint can come from anybody and we have many problems in south asia that if you open a hotline a lot of uh, complaints that come in are not even relevant and actually the the regular a beneficiary gets drowned out in this high noise on the other hand if you conduct a survey kind of a mechanism as the case we are advocating here it brings out both the positive and the negative it is focused on systems it has less noise it's more active you probably were not able to listen to this uh, hear this video or see this video very well but as you saw it is an sms sent by the minister to the citizens which actually starts the engagement and that obviously has a very strong communication element to it the important thing is that once you have this large survey data you're not just focused on redressing individual complaints which you can do that too but you would rather have systems improvements and have performance dialogues with your uh, chain of command so that you have a systems improvement and a large scale improvement in service delivery that is the core part of this objective we 
my co-authors Tony Vahanen and Jody Kuzak in our book Logged On talk about this in more detail. And as we describe in the book, this particular way of engagement creates a lot of possibilities for entry in a service in a difficult service delivery situation, whether as Yana just mentioned, it is a, a vertical accountability kind of, you know, closed system or it is an open democratic system. These kind of proactive engagement, even on behalf of the politician, provide a very good entering point of starting a virtuous cycle of service delivery improvement. And the skill that you can reach a lot of people with, I think is the key message that we would like to communicate during this session. Thank you, Yana. Over to you, if you could kindly talk about more specifically the Albanian example. Thank you, Zubair. Um, so let me talk for a little moment about what we did in Albania, just to add on the video that you have all watched. Um, here we were preparing a new project, a new loan called Citizen-Centered uh, Public Services. Uh, which uh, focuses on improving quality and access to select administrative services in Albania. So, so the government is very much interested in bringing up the standard of public services to the European level. Now, one of the biggest problems with uh, service delivery in Albania is not that the state is incapable of delivering services, of issuing driver's licenses or, or property certificates or, or health cards or uh, pensions. Um, the state is quite capable of doing this, but it's not of sufficient quality and it's plagued by petty corruption, by delays and petty corruption. So as we were preparing this project, we were working very closely with the Ministry of State for anti-corruption and local issues, uh, Minister Chuchi, whom you have seen in the video. And this was also around the time when the government was planning to launch this reactive or curative uh, hotline that Zubair was just talking about. Um, it's, it's a website where, where citizens can um, um, add their complaints. Well, when we told them about these new ways of proactively reaching out to citizens, um, our government counterparts got very excited for several reasons. One is that fighting petty corruption was one of the key initiatives uh, in improving service delivery. So, so that was one reason. Second is that this government of Albania is very focused on performance management. Um, on monitoring uh, service delivery, on using um, uh, evidence-based policy making to, to improve it. It has established a delivery unit in the center of government in Prime Minister's office, a unit that is responsible for tracking performance of the government. So um, uh, that also appealed to them that with this text message initiative, they would get a lot of new data, um, and um, that data would enable them to monitor and follow up on service quality. Well, the, the third um, reason was that this government was very much intent on increasing trust of citizens, right? So um, it was not just about service delivery, it was not just about reducing corruption, it was not just about making the government work in new ways. It was also getting the citizens to trust the government to reduce this informality. In fact, the current prime minister, Edi Rama, uh, was the former mayor of Tirana um, for, for 11 years before he became prime minister. And he is famous for very unorthodox initiatives, such as painting um, the gray buildings in Tirana in these garish, beautiful colors. And if you want to watch his TED talk, he will tell you that 
painting those those colors, uh, I mean, painting uh, those buildings in those colors actually made citizens believe in state more, trust the state more, pay taxes more, feel more safe, and so on. Uh, it's worth watching. I really recommend it. Um, but but the, the point is that uh, you have a leader who really believes that trust, these intangible things, actually make a huge difference in, in, in how the state works. And we know from other studies, like the one I had just shown you, that that indeed seems to be the case. So to, to summarize, the citizen feedback mechanism that, that we had helped Albanians build marries three things. The anti-corruption complaint in this particular case, the performance management aspect where the center of government delivery unit can track service delivery, and the third is really building trust. So you've seen in the, in the movie um, how citizens talk about getting these text messages uh, from the minister. Minister Chuchi, they're extremely happy to get those messages. Yes, some of them report corrupt activities, but many of them, and in fact, most of them thank Minister Chuchi for reaching out. They start believing that the government truly cares about them and about the services and about their experience with, with, with the services. So in that sense, it's, um, it's, it's a coup de grace for, for, for the government to um, uh, to have such an initiative. You've seen the numbers of what we've done in Albania. This is a country of 3 million, to give you a, uh, to give you a um, reference point, and um, the citizen uh, feedback mechanism has reached now about 60,000 citizens. So, so it's a lot in, in, in this country. Um, and what we did there, we focused on food services that are considered most corrupt, this is the anti-corruption part of it. Um, uh, we focused on um, hospitals, six state-run hospitals, and uh, on um, uh, property registration offices. So these two services, according to, to existing survey, surveys, have most corruption. So citizen, suppose you're a citizen in Albania. If you come to a hospital, you register, uh, you're also asked to leave your cell phone number, your mobile number, and after you're discharged or after you receive the, the treatment, um, after a short time you will get a text message from, from Minister Chuchi saying, hi, I am I am Vladi Chuchi, I'm the minister responsible for anti-corruption. Our records indicate you have just received um, a, a treatment in Mother Teresa Hospital in Tirana. Uh, please reply to this message if you were asked to pay a bribe. And um, um, we have helped the government to um, install uh, a dashboard to uh, monitor uh, the responses and to um, address the most urgent cases. But also, it's not just about addressing the urgent cases, as Zubay has said. It's really um, pinpointing trends, right? Is this a particular ward in a particular hospital that gets most complaints? Um, can a particular manager be identified? Can, can a particular doctor be identified? Um, what is it systemically that the government can do to, to uh, change this? So this is just an overview of, of the Albania experience. But the Albania experience was, in fact, an application of um, a previous experience in Punjab that, that Zubair had uh, pioneered. So over to Zubair, who can who can give you a flavor of a much more advanced um, uh, system reaching a, a lot larger number of people. Zubair, over to you. Thank you, Jan. In Punjab, uh, this was started uh, some years ago. And as of now, uh, across 36 districts uh, of Punjab, something like 8 million citizens have been contacted in this manner. Uh, across services uh, in health, land administration, policing, uh, rescue services, about 16 such services. And more than a million citizens 
have replied with their feedback as yana was mentioning a lot of them is simply thank you for asking while obviously there are complaints about corruption and about bad service and bad attitude in a health outlet and and most interestingly feedback which says that okay i was charged extra or people were uh, you know forced me to pay extra money but still i thank you for asking about this and in punjab case we have the sms messages going on behalf of the chief minister a very energetic proactive chief minister who is well known for his anti corruption crusades and interestingly before the text message his automated voice uh starts uh leads the sms message so there is a robo call which for a minute or so in his voice tells the citizen that they will receive an sms message they have received the service could they kindly provide feedback and given the low literacy environment of punjab this kind of advanced warning uh in in the chief minister's voice of all the voices is very relevant and helps and we have seen in data helps raise uh feedback uh quantity as well as uh, quality uh, now in in uh, in pakistan uh, if you go get a passport service which is a federal government service and there are about 12000 people who get passports every day they will get a text message from the director general of the passport asking about the quality of services they received and the director general is turning these into kpis and he's using these kpis to talk to his uh, managers about the quality of service and how they can improve it similarly in punjab several of these uh, uh, patterns and data are used in the meetings of the chief secretary as well as some data is used in the meetings of the chief minister to ask questions about quality obviously a lot of district managers are using this to address individual grievances and something like uh, uh, 7000 such actions have been taken but the important thing is and part of these uh, corrective actions which have been reported into the dashboard are examples of performance uh, uh, queries about systemic sort of issues why there is a pattern of a problem why there is a pattern of data quality and i think that's always going to lead to much more improvements i must uh, point out that in punjab this exercise is is funded by the government of punjab we have been technically engaged uh, uh, from the world bank point of view with this exercise but it is led by the punjab information technology board uh, and it is with the leadership of dr umar saif who is the chairman and fasi mahta that this large scale exercise has happened and is now being uh, channeled into uh very different interesting ways for example in the health sector of improving basic service delivery we conducted a small evaluation uh of this uh, going back to about 20000 citizens uh who have received service over time and whose names are recorded in the system and asked them what did they think about the quality of service delivery whether it improved petty corruption has decreased and things like that well you know they all of them uh said that it is improved and all of that although there's no counterfactual there one interesting thing which emerged was that those who could recall the chief minister's voice or the chief minister text message compared with those who could not for example if you don't pick up the phone or for some reason you don't see the text message those who could recall were more likely by about 10 to 15 percentage points to say that corruption has decreased so it there is some sort of tentative evidence there that the mere fact of proactive state engagement in a context like south asia or some other place where there is a high trust deficit and people think that the state is not interested that kind of engagement can lead to some positive uh, improvements similarly for example in police you get an sms that has the police arrived in time if you asked for some emergency service or you would get an sms uh in in 
in in the case of livestock service that you know the did the livestock agent come and did he or she provide the right service was there any problem there is actually now a randomized control trial with the tentative results which seek feedback which sought feedback in the livestock context from people who received or the farmers who received for their cattle different insemination services and what we find is there is a substantial uh, uh, increase uh, in quality of service as well as decrease in uh, in uh, charges uh, uh, in the fees paid and of course those include informal fees which uh, which uh, continue to uh, happen so increasingly some evidence which would uh, which would uh, make an argument that this is not only does it make common sense because all of us uh, know that engaging the citizens who are finally the beneficiaries of all our efforts is an important idea we can probably also see some growing bit of evidence that this sort of uh, uh, proactive engagement can have an impact on trust corruption service delivery quality and more trials are underway uh, to find out uh, the exact evidence on this sort of uh, exercise uh, yana over to you maybe you can talk about the more uh, uh, specific uh, of how to roll this out in different contexts thank you Okay, so um, what I'd like to talk about for the next couple of minutes is um, how can anybody do with any government and what type of challenges in building the citizen feedback mechanism you will most likely encounter. So first, your, your first question would be how much does this cost? Uh, we have already insinuated the answer. The answer is not much, as in, um, Text messaging is extremely cheap in general. Um, so it's not a huge investment of money for the government. However, um, there are some considerations that will affect cost, right? The question is, how many people do you want to reach? So of course, in a place like Albania, it's a lot smaller than in a place like Punjab. We're talking about tens of thousands in Albania, and we're talking about millions in Punjab. So it, it's, it's, a different, it's a different scale. Uh, there is also a question of um, um, how sophisticated of a system you want to set up to monitor those responses. And you must, in order for, for this to work, you must have a system of monitoring responses. It's not just, you know, the minister will be sending text messages and then will be looking at them in the evening at his leisure. Absolutely not. You, you, you need to, to, to set up a system, ideally linking it to your existing, be it anti-corruption or performance management or service delivery monitoring systems. So in, in the case of Albania, um, uh, the system uh, the, that, that monitors uh, text messages and analyzes them is connected to the hotline, to the website that I had uh, mentioned, uh, the, the Eurocent one, the, the active one, the citizens can lodge their complaints, right? So, so cost, again, is a function of all of those things, how sophisticated of a receiving end system and how many people you want to reach. But in general, one thing to remember is that this is relatively quick and relatively cheap, right? Second, challenge will have to do with regulatory issues. Here's what I mean by this. Um, when we were setting up the system in Albania, we ran into um, the issue with the four cell phone companies. There are just four companies on the market in Albania. And there the question was, who will pay for the uh, return message. So, okay, uh, the government can pay for, for um, or even the cell phone companies can say, we'll let the government send these bulk messages for free. They will do some kind of a 
you know, corporate service to to the government and what have you, or public service. But the question is, who will pay for the citizen to respond to the minister? Right? You don't want the citizen to pay. Uh, you want that message to be free to the citizen, but somebody needs to pay. So is it the government that pays, or what, what kind of a deal is there that the government strikes with, uh, with the cell phone provider, with the mobile provider? Um, so again, this, this is context specific, and this is just something that, that you will need to think about. Um, another issue um, related to regulatory and legal framework uh, are the privacy laws. So, Remember the way it works, and the only way it can work is that you, the citizen, coming to um, the point of uh, service, public service, receiving public service, actually share your cell phone number. Now, the government really shouldn't require the citizen to share the cell phone number. It should be voluntary. I mean, in some countries, you do have a provision that if it's in the public interest, you must. Um, there, the privacy laws don't apply. But in general, you're trying to build trust. You're, this is supposed to be a friendly initiative. So it, you shouldn't really force your citizen if he or she is not willing to, to participate. So there should be an opt-out clause in receiving or not receiving your phone number. If they do not participate. Um, in our Albanian experience, I don't think this has been a huge issue. Uh, perhaps even surprisingly so, given the relatively low low levels of trust um, in the government, uh, citizens were very open. Um, but uh, but it may be an issue, something to be aware of. Okay, um, the third challenge and third thing to think about uh, has to do with tools uh, you will uh, employ to send and process the data. I talked about those a little bit uh, when I was talking about the cost, since you know the sophistication of these tools will influence the cost. But at the very minimum, as I said, this, this can only work if you do have a way to track responses and make some sense of them. Um, again, to repeat myself and to repeat to bear, but this is really important, so I will say it for the, th for the third time. It is not the case that every single um, response from a citizen here needs a follow-up. This is not a reactive organization. This is a, so to speak, ongoing survey that um, allows you to discern trends um, and, and systems and patterns. Right? But for that, you still need a particular tool. Right? So what are those tools? Well, at, at the minimum, you need a dashboard and dedicated staff that, that, will, um, that will sort the, the uh, SMS responses and prepare some sort of a report for the powers that be. In Albania, those powers that be are very high. In fact, the highest. So it's, it's the prime minister and his minister of state for who are directly interested in this. And as I had mentioned, in Albania there is a dedicated unit, a delivery unit, in the center of government, the prime minister's office, that is involved. So the delivery unit prepares a regular report for prime minister on um, the responses to these text messages. So you need um, you know, both dedicated staff and some kind of an institutional mechanism to trickle up this information to the decision makers who um, can actually can do something about it. Uh, so I guess this much on, on the tools. Uh, fourth, you want to think about the context. So when we talked about Albania, we talked mostly about anti-corruption. But it doesn't have to be just an anti-corruption tool inside of the campaign. Zubair talked quite a bit about livestock. So, so the context can be, well, yeah, you're trying to fight petty corruption, but maybe you're trying to reduce teacher absenteeism, or maybe you're trying to reduce delays. Um, 
maybe you are trying to produce, um, I don't know, rudeness of, of your public officials uh, and, and make, you know, them adopt a real service culture. Maybe um, you're trying to increase cleanliness of your hospitals and whatnot. So this context will dictate about what type of questions you will ask in, in, in your text message. So it doesn't have to be where you ask to pay your bribe. It can even be you know, how do I look at the fortress and the light? And was the hospital clean? Uh, was the, um, I don't know, was the present of your child a small one? And so on. So, so the context will, will dictate this. And very relatedly, a uh, final point I'm going to, to make, um, uh, another challenge we're thinking to think about is how to experiment. So, so there, there are various ways of experimenting with text messages. Um, you can phrase them in different ways and get different types of responses in different ways. You can send them at different times of the day and get different responses. Um, uh, also matters who sends it. Um, we find that it's best if you know a very high level official sends sends a text message because that's uh, you know really flatters uh, or flatters it. Um, you know what what is the length of, of a particular message? There are no right or wrong answers to this. Um, different things work in different contexts. So context and experimentation are, are very much related. So with this, these are these are just five um, challenges that you will likely encounter. With this, over to, to Zubair, who will talk about risk. Um, thank you, Yana. Uh, well, we. Uh, have uh, kind of tried to sell this idea, uh, obviously, but uh, you know it obviously has limitations and uh, risks. Uh, Jana has already uh, talked about uh, uh, you know privacy issues and regulatory issues that one has to be very mindful of. But uh, uh, when you actually implement it, you will also. Uh, face the challenge of data quality because the very service providers whom you're trying to monitor may want to scam or fudge the cell numbers they write or send you to break this chain. There are ways to get around it. For example, if you call an emergency service, that number is already logged and cannot be fudged. But in some cases, this could be an issue. The other point is not all, in many contexts, not all citizens will be uh, SMS literate in, in India, Pakistan, for example. Uh, very, uh, relatively a small fraction of uh, citizens is SMS literate. And that's why we try to use the chief minister's voice. But you can always use call centers and call center agents to call people and ask questions. And then you can have a very structured conversation with a very clear targeted audience about uh, for three minutes or five minutes and, and enter data. Uh, and obviously, all of us have experienced such calls uh, from different uh, uh, private sector or other companies. We may not really like them though, that much, but this is one way, obviously, for any service provider to reach out uh, and survey its, uh, its customers uh, about quality. Uh, obviously, this is a much more costly option and therefore our emphasis on SMS because it's much cheaper. Calls obviously on the other hand would be uh, you can do a sample basis or something like this. So rural outreach is a challenge but then you can possibly deal with this using calls. Uh, reaching women for example in, 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 in Pakistani contacts or Afghanistan is a challenge because Cell numbers, cell phones are often owned by the husband or the brother or somebody like that. But this is definitely an issue. But again, we have tried to uh, uh, do two things. One, the call, if there's a call, is made by a female so that access to the female of the household becomes easy. Or you may want to call only towards the evening when the males of the household are home and one can reach the uh, female members of the household. A big issue is citizen uh, knowledge of quality. 
in some cases citizens are very well aware in some cases they are not for example uh, they may not even know how much fee is officially uh, required for a particular service uh, therefore all the emphasis also in this particular case on receipts and other ways of letting citizens know how much is the actual cost of the service. Uh, they may not know, uh, they may can see the teacher presence, but they may not, especially the poorer ones, may not have a very good sense of how well the teacher is uh, teaching. Uh, and one can think of many other contexts where this could be a, a problem. Uh, there might also be, in the case of petty corruption, there might be, and we have seen that, a cultural acceptance of petty corruption. Uh, you call people up and they say, well, I paid money and I don't have a problem because this is the way it is done. Uh, sometimes people may not want to uh, complain about, uh, about any petty official, may not want to have that fight. But then over a century, two centuries, or three centuries of this practice, uh, they may have gotten used to it, and maybe that's the way uh, you know the things are done, and it's very difficult to break that practice. But that obviously should not stop the state from continuing to try, because you have to try, and as Jana mentioned, uh, reduce the informality of practices by uh, by continuously trying to increase trust in in uh, in what the government is doing and the state is doing and obviously the last issue which comes a data analysis issue once you have lots of data like 8 million you know people contacted 1 million citizens even communi uh, responding even communicating that complex data to decision makers in 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 easily understandable comparable manner becomes quite a challenge uh, but obviously that's something again with hard work can be uh, taken care of uh, with this Mm, Yana, over to you. Uh, uh, I think our presentation should be finished and we can have uh, questions and answers. Thank you, Zubair. Um, I don't think we have gotten any questions from the webinar participants. So, um, of the last few minutes, uh, dear participants, to type in your questions if, uh, if there's anything that was unclear or future in this. Uh, perhaps just a few closing remarks here, and then I'll um, uh, uh, turn the floor over to Zubair one more time for, for his closing remarks. Um, it has been it has been a very rewarding experience to work on this in Albania personally, um, because you know you leave the the, uh, the rarefied halls of, of the center of government or various ministries, and you really um, get uh, to know what is it that the citizens care about and, and see um, the impact of, of the reform that they're trying to help with. Um, and then you, see the citizen on, uh, you see the impact on, on the real people. So, so it is, it is a labor of love, so to speak, for, for us as well. Um, so Barry, I know if you want to add anything. No, I personally, I can only say that every time I see a message which essentially says thank you for asking, uh, it just uh, warms the cockles of my heart because it's a simple, uh, simple, simple thing to do. And if we can engage uh, more and more citizens uh, in this manner or any other uh, manner, that always is a good idea. After all, that's the whole point of development, isn't it? Thank you, Bear. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in and participating. Um, two things I would like to mention. One, after you log off, uh, you will be asked to provide feedback on this webinar. Our team here is working very hard to make this better, easier to use, more accessible. So please, we very much value the feedback to the service. Um, and second, uh, this webinar has been recorded, and it will be edited. The quality and the link to the recording will be shared with all of you via email after this recording. So with this, thank you very much again. Uh, it was a pleasure. We were delighted to share our experience with you.